All right. Welcome to the WPSGHA webinar on medical review findings and outpatient rehabilitative therapy. And today we are talking about certifications and recertifications. My name is Mary Sue Gardner, and I'm a nurse on the Provider Outreach and Education Department. And I'm joined today by Jennifer and Rachel, the other nurses on Provider Outreach and Education, who are gonna be assisting me with the chat feature, as well as the question and answer portion of today's call. So this is the third in a four-part series that I've been hosting this week on various components of documentation issues. Should you find that you were unable to attend the other parts of this webinar series, they will all be posted on our YouTube as Encore events within about a week of the live event. So on your screen now, and if you're following along in the slide deck is a disclaimer. And basically, we have this disclaimer for all of our events, and it says, we prepared this education as a tool to assist you, and we followed the Medicare laws, rules, and regulations. But they often change, and it's your responsibility as the provider to make sure you're following the most current laws, rules, and regulations, because they will be the final determining factor of coverage. CMS also prohibits the recording of our presentation or screenshotting it for any profit making purposes. Since we don't know what your, your intent to use it for would be, if you are recording, please stop. Um, we are again going to post this to our YouTube as an encore so you can view it again. Now on the screen is a list of common acronyms and these are the same acronyms I've been showing over the last couple of days, but these are common acronyms in um, therapy service. So if I happen to refer to one of these acronyms and you don't know what it means, just refer back to this list. All right, my overall objective for today is to help you learn about the Medicare review findings surrounding certifications and recertifications of outpatient rehabilitative therapy services. So from here on, I'll, I'll just refer to it as therapy services. I hope to achieve this by reviewing the coverage criteria. We're also gonna discuss the essentials of documentation for certification and recertification. I'm gonna tell you about some of the common medical review findings so you can avoid these findings in the future, as well as give you some tips that may be helpful to better document your certification and recertification requirements. So um, just to reiterate, everything we're talking about today is um, in regards to outpatient rehabilitative therapy services, PTOT and SLP services in the outpatient setting. So the outpatient regs form the foundation or the basis for all rehabilitative therapy services, regardless of the place of service. So if a place of service is silent on a specific component of therapy services, then you would go back and follow the outpatient regulations. Now, with that being said, some of the certification and recertification requirements we know are different on different places of service. For instance, skilled nursing facility has different regs on how the therapy services and how SNP services in general get certified and recertified. So if you're working in an inpatient service, you can go to this section of the outpatient regs and then it will prompt you in the very beginning of section 220 as to where to find the inpatient regulations for um, like skilled nursing facility services. There are four basic criteria of coverage for outpatient therapy services. So just a quick review of the overall coverage for outpatient therapy services. This information has appeared each day in this series, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it's important to understand and remember the overall coverage for outpatient therapy services. 
as that criteria also plays a huge role in documentation issues, which leads to denial of services. So these four basic coverage criteria are that you need to render services that are need-based. So the, the patient needs you, your skills, your expertise, your licensure um, in order to progress in their therapy services or for it to benefit them. So you need to provide services that are skilled and under your license set. They need you and your specific expertise. Services also need to be established under a written plan of care. And that plan of care can be established by the physician or non-physician practitioner, but generally they are um, established by the actual therapist. And the care that you're providing must relate directly and specifically to that plan of care. So if something else arises with the patient, it has to be incorporated into your plan of care. You just can't treat something that you haven't identified. The care also needs to be um, provided for a patient that is under the care of a physician. So um, how do we find that in Medicare? How do we prove that the person is under the care of a physician? We have you obtain a certification and any recertifications when those are required. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. So today's event you know, is really specific to the certification recertification component. That component helps to also um, establish the rest of these coverage criteria. All right, so there are some components of documentation that are required for therapy services. And these are the ones that we have been going over um, this week. So we have already talked about evaluation and plan of care. Certification and cert recertifications are what we're going to talk about today. We talked about progress reports or progress notes yesterday. And tomorrow we're going to talk about daily treatment notes. All right. So coverage criteria for certifications and recertifications. Again, if you participate participated in or listened to the encore of the general therapy presentation that was held in January, then you probably heard a little bit about the overall coverage criteria. Even if you did, this is a good time to review what Medicare requires as far as certifications and recertifications. So in the interest of time, we're gonna go through this kind of quickly, but if you have questions, please be sure to place those in the chat. Or um, if, you're, if you're listening to the encore after this, you can place those questions into YouTube comment sections or go back and listen to the encore, the event from January. All right, so care of a physician and physician certification go hand in hand. So we're gonna talk about both components of coverage. Um, as we spoke about earlier, one of the overall coverage criteria requirements for outpatient therapy services is that the patient is under the care of a physician, and secondly, that the physician certifies and, when necessary, recertifies the overall plan of care. Um, certification serves both purposes. It proves that they're under the care of the physician and it's proof of the certification. So improving that your patient is under the care of a physician, Medicare does require certification of the plan. We don't require an order for outpatient therapy services. Although there's no Medicare requirement for an order, when documenting in the medical record, an order provides evidence that the patient both needs therapy services and is under the care of a physician. So if you get one, keep it, make it part of your permanent record. And if you are asked to submit your documentation for review, just download that order and submit it as well. 
The certification requirements are met when the position certifies the overall plan. So if the signed order includes a plan of care, then no further certification of the plan is required. However, if the therapist alters that plan of care sent by a physician, then it does require additional certification. So if you listen to the evaluation plan of care recertification event, I said that a physician or non-physician practitioner can write the plan of care. This generally doesn't happen in outpatient services. What generally happens is the physician may send a plan to the therapist who, the therapist is the expert. They then take the physician or non-physician practitioner sends, they add the modalities, the assessments, et cetera, um, then they do the updates to the plan, how they're going to carry it out, the amount, frequency, and duration, and then those updates are usually sent back to the physician for, for certification. Remember, payment is dependent on certification of the plan rather than an order. But the use of an order is prudent to determine that a physician was involved in the care, you know, and you have a name of someone to certify. So while you don't have to have it, if you do get it, just make it part of your permanent record and make sure that that's the physician you're reaching out to to obtain your certification. All right, so moving on, let's talk about the method and disposition of certification. Certifications require a dated signature on the plan of care or some other document that indicates approval of the plan of care. It is not appropriate for a physician or non-physician practitioner to certify a plan if the patient was not under the care of some physician at the time of treatment or if the patient did not need treatment. Since there are provisions for delayed certification that are allowable, the date the certification is signed is important to determine if it is timely or if it is delayed. So the certification must relate to treatment during the interval on the claim. Unless there is reason to believe that a plan was not signed appropriately or it's not timely or no further evidence that the patient was under the care of a physician or non-physician practitioner and um, that the patient needed the care, that would be, you know, the certification would be the only thing that's required. So the format of all certifications and recertifications and the method by which they are obtained is determined by the individual facility or practitioner. Um, so we don't tell you that it's got to be any specific place or any specific type. Acceptable documentation of certification can be um, a physician's progress note or the physician, non-physician practitioner order or a plan of care that's signed and dated by the physician or non-physician practitioner. And it indicates that that physician or NPP is aware that the therapy service is or was in progress and the physician or NPP makes no record of disagreement with the plan when there's evidence that the plan was sent or it's available for um, record or review by that physician or non-physician practitioner. So for example on that, if during the course of treatment under certified plan of care, the physician sends an order for continued treatment for two more weeks, we as your contractor shall accept that order as certification of continued treatment for two more weeks under the same plan of care. If a new certification is for less treatment, then was previously planned and certified, then this new certification is going to take the place of any previous certification. So at the end of that two weeks, another certification would be required 
if further treatment documented continued to be medically reasonable and necessary. So all certifications should be re, um, retained in the clinical record and available if requested by the contractor. All right, so that was a lot, but we're gonna explain it all a little further. Um, let's talk about the timing of the certification and any necessary recertifications. The initial certification is due as soon as possible after the plan of care is established. The regulations used to say as soon as reasonable and practicable, but now they've changed that to say as soon as possible after the care plan is established. So as soon as possible means that the physician or non-physician practitioner shall certify the initial plan as soon as it's obtained or within 30 days of the initial therapy treatment. Since payment may be denied if a physician does not certify the plan, the therapist should forward the plan to the physician as soon as it's established. Um, evidence of of diligence in providing the plan to the physician may be considered by us as your Medicare contractor during the review if in the event that certification becomes delayed. So timely certification of the initial plan is met when that physician or non-physician practitioner certifies the plan it's documented by signature or by verbal order and dated within 30 days following the first day of treatment. And that includes the evaluation. If the order to certify is verbal, it must be followed within 14 days by a signature to be considered timely. So keep that in mind. If you get a verbal order that says, yes, I certify your treatment and overall care plan, you document that you took that as a verbal order, but you also have to get a signature um, in place from that position within 14 days. So a dated notation of the order to certify the plan should be made in the patient's medical record. Um, recertification is not required if the duration of the initially certified plan of care is more than the duration or the length of the entire episode of treatment. So we're, we'll go through and talk about that, you know, a little more as well. Initial certifications are good for 90 days or the end of the duration of the plan of care or when a significant change warrants a formal reevaluation. So remember the ORs in that statement. If you requested a plan of care to be certified and your plan of care included treatment one time a day, three times a week, for three weeks, then your initial certification would only be good for three weeks. Um, if there was some sort of significant change in the patient's functional status that warrants a reevaluation, then that would also cancel out that initial certification timeframe and force you to obtain an updated certification. So again, the initial is good for 90 days. If you think you need 90 days based on that patient's presentation or the length of time, which would be duration of the initial plan, or in the event of a significant, significant change in functional status, which again forces a reevaluation. All right, so recertifications. Um, Recertification documents the need for continued or modified therapy and should be signed whenever the need for a significant modification of the plan becomes evident. Or again, at least every 90 days after the initial treatment under that plan unless 
they are delayed. So the timing of the recertifications, as we've, we've already mentioned, are at the end of 90 calendar days, at the end of the duration of the plan, or again, when there's significant change that warrants a formal reevaluation. Now, let's take what we learned in the progress notes webinar and, re and apply that information to the recertification process. As I said in that educational event, your progress notes are your time to shine as a therapist. Medical review staff look at the progress notes to support continued need for therapy services. So if your progress notes are reflecting continued need, then it's going, if they're not reflecting, I'm sorry, continued need, then it's gonna be hard for a physician to support your decision to recertify additional therapy. So the burden of proof is in your documentation to support that continued need. If you need to continue past the initial certified period, then your documentation, especially your progress notes, should support the why. If you need to significantly modify your plan of care because of some sort of unexpected significant change, and this is gonna force you to um, obtain a recertification like we had talked about, then um, you have to send that update for recertification to that physician so they know exactly what's going on with the patient and why you are completely scrapping and changing your plan of care. So I hope that by today, all these components of documentation are really starting to fall in place for you and help you identify why they are so important independently, but how they actually play on each other as well. So remember, certifications are timely when they're dated within 30 days of initial treatment. Recertifications are timely when they're dated during the duration of the plan or within that 90 calendar days of initial treatment. But what happens if you do not obtain a certification or recertification in the required timeframes noted? There are actually provisions in the regulations that will allow for delayed certifications. So delayed certifications and recertification requirements will be deemed satisfied where at any later date, a physician or non-physician practitioner makes a certification accompanied by the reason for the delay. So certifications are acceptable without justification for up to 30 days after the due date. But just to reiterate, a delayed certification and recertification must be accompanied by a reason for the delay if it's outside that 30 days from the due date. Delayed certifications, um, can include one or more certification or recertifications on a single signed document that is also dated by the physician. Delayed certifications should include any evidence the provider or supplier considers necessary to justify the delay. For example, a certification may be delayed because the physician didn't sign it, uh, because maybe it got lost in the office. Maybe it came in via hard copy and it got lost. In the case of a long delayed certification over six months, the provider or supplier may choose to submit without the delayed certification um, some other document like an order, progress notes, telephone contact, you know, other certifications and recertifications that indicate the need for care and that the patient was under the care of a physician at that time. So, you know, maybe you never got the, the recertification and they were under a 
care of a physician and we have evidence by the first certification and maybe they sent an order too. We'll take that information into consideration. Um, we will request that and you will be required and it will be taken into consideration. That doesn't mean that's going to necessarily pass. Um, but what you can do is document every attempt that you've made to contact that physician. So it's not intended that needed therapy be stopped or denied when a certification is delayed. The delayed certification of otherwise covered service should be accepted unless we as your contractor have reason to believe that there's no physician involved in the patient's care or that the treatment did not meet the patient's need, therefore the certification was signed appropriate, inappropriately. So let's think about this statement for a little bit. It would be easier to prove on recertification that there was physician involvement because, um, you know, if they initially signed the first certification. When it comes to initial certification, if you have nothing from your attempts, then it's gonna be a little harder for us to believe that the patient was under the care of a physician. So if you are requested, um, requesting initial certification and you're getting close to the end of that 30 days and you do not have a response back from that physician, Make sure you are documenting every request that you send and the manner that that request was made. But you should also start thinking about the fact that we could deny those services because really there's no proof that that patient was under the care of a physician. So again, document every attempt that you made, whether you send it via mail, whether you send it electronically, whether you send that via carrier pigeon. Document every attempt that you made, the dates that you made it, and how you made that request. Again, for the initial certification, it's much harder to prove that there is physician involvement if we have nothing. So um, you may want to consider you know, letting the patient know this could become patient liability if we can't get some sort of physician involvement. All right, so common review findings. Remember when we discussed the basics of required documentation? Well, that's right, certifications and recertifications are part of the required documentation requirements for therapy services. So if the initial certification or any required recertifications are missing and there's no justification of the delay or, or no justification why it wasn't obtained, then it could result in denial of services. Remember your certification and recertifications are the way to support that your patient is under the care of the physician. So make sure you're following your timelines, documenting those appropriately and keeping them in your documentation. And most importantly, if we request medical review or if one of the, cert con or one of the medical review contractors for CMS, like CERT or RAC requests it for medical review, make sure it's um, downloaded and submitted with your documentation. The next is illegible signatures. Believe it or not, we still get some paper documentation. Um, maybe the physician has signed it and then scanned it back in and resubmitted it. If we can't support who this is and that they are actually a physician, then it's going to be hard for us to accept that. This could be anyone's signature. So we can't in good faith say, yes, this squiggle squiggle actually belongs to a physician that the patient is under the care of. So if you get something like this, it is allowable 
as long as we have a printed signature and credentialing below it. And it also needs to be dated. So make sure if this is what you're getting, it appears with a printed signature, credentials, and date. Timeliness requirements without delay. Remember your timeliness requirements for your certifications and recertifications. And if you're unable to obtain them within the required time frame, you can utilize the provision for delayed certification. So if that delay is greater than 30 days, it must be accompanied by an attestation of why the certification timeliness requirements were not met as well as a statement that the patient was actually under the care of the physician during that time. So if you are significantly delayed, make sure your certification and recertification statements contain that attestation of why and that they, you know, are the physicians also saying that they were under that physician's care. So just some some tips for your certification and recertification. Send the initial as soon as possible. Document how it was sent, the manner in which it was sent, the date in which it was sent. Document every attempt to reach that physician or non-physician practitioner. Um, make sure you continue to follow the timing requirements. A, a certification is not due um, at the end of every month. Remember that requirement is the end or at 90 days or the end of the initial certified plan, that plan's duration, or if there's a significant change. Obtain justification of delayed certification. So if you are significantly delayed and you send to a physician and you finally get a response back with just a signature and it's beyond that 30 days past due, you're going to need to go back to that physician and ask them for a justification of why they were delayed as well as to let you know they were under the care of that physician at the time. All right. So that was a lot of information that we covered today. My overall objective today was that you learned how to avoid those medical review findings in your documentation of your certifications and recertifications. So I think we accomplished this today by reviewing that coverage criteria. We went through those documentation essentials we talked about those common findings and some tips to help you avoid um, any findings in the future regarding your certifications and recertifications. All right, seeing no more questions or no questions in the chat. On behalf of Provider Outreach and Education, as well as our Medical Review Department, we wanna thank you for taking part in this educational event. We look forward to your participation in future events as well. So at this time, you may now disconnect.